Well, thank you, Kathy. Uh, and let me thank uh, Dr. McCoy as well for inviting me to, to be here. I've spent the last couple of days uh, talking to some of you uh, and, uh, and learned that uh, many of you already are up to date on what I'm about ready to, to say, but I see some students out there and I think this is a, hopefully you uh, learn a little bit about the federal government and a little bit more how it works. Um, what I've been impressed with here is the uh, multidisciplinary nature of things. You have various sciences working together. Things seem to be uh, going quite well in that regard. I've been to places where their stovepipes are too big and you can't get communication. Looks pretty good from my point of view, but of course I only saw a few. So maybe there are others that, that are still uh, cloistered, but looks pretty good. And I'm going to be talking about a topic, Earth observations, which are also have to be multidisciplinary um, by their nature in order to be useful and, uh, and provide the greatest amount of value and be a, really a foundation for good science that you all are, are doing. So let's get into the topic. Um, I'm going to be looking at my notes from time to time. Hope that doesn't... Uh, I do know the material, but uh, I want to get this right. I've got 45 minutes. Oh, and uh, if you have a compelling question, you're just dying to ask, you can go ahead and do it. Otherwise, uh, 45 minutes, I should be done. We'll have 15 minutes. I'm told that's okay within the time. And uh, you can ask all your questions if you have there. So that might be the preferred way, but uh, great questions shouldn't, shouldn't wait. Okay, uh, I'm going to be talking about the importance of Earth observations. I'll give you a definition up front. A uh, little bit about uh, data sharing because I've spent most of my life uh, on that topic at various times and uh, can't help but uh, say a little bit about it. And then uh, the rest of the talk on the federal government and its programs, some of which are already here. So that's why we don't have to go into them uh, much. But they're, um, it's interesting to know the full range. So just because you're working with NASA or DOE, maybe you haven't thought about the seven others that are out there. And I'll go through each agency and give you a little snapshot. So that's what we'll do. Um, Kathy's giving me, giving uh, you all my background, um, there actually was some hands-on uh, observations earlier in my career. Uh, built buoys and uh, was one of the first to take a thermistor and send it through a satellite and get the result on the, on the ground the other side in the 70s, early 70s. Um, and uh, all those things look pretty commonplace now. Uh, and uh, you can go down to Walmart and do it now. But then it was a challenging thing, and uh, I, I, I was in oceanography first, then went to meteorology, then I went to satellites. Uh, I'm a little weak in areas with many of you have, like ecology, but I know it's really important, so I'll be referencing that too as we go through. Let's start with a definition, at least the one I like, of Earth observation. It's Earth-centric, so it is uh, everything above, obser observations above, on and below, to the core of the earth, starting at the surface of the sun. So it's a lot of real estate. Uh, and uh, it's physics, it's chemistry, biology, ecology. And in this broader definition that's, that's uh, starting to be used, it includes a social dimension, a human dimension as well. So it's all of that. Uh, and when you talk about observations, of course, you're right next door to the science. So uh, it includes the, the uh, scientific application of those uh, uh, observations. In the uh, time domain, it's seconds to years. You pick it. I'm most comfortable, and we'll, when I reference things like uh, satellites, I'm most comfortable in the... Uh, 100 meters to a kilometer range and hours to days. Uh, I've not done much work in the microsecond region, but I've seen some observations, very interesting. And I've also seen them on the scale of 1,000 years, so, uh, which are harder. Those are surrogates, of course. 
but um, it's, uh, those are all part of this uh, universe uh, that I'm talking about. <clears throat> Where we have gotten to now in globally, and I, I tend to talk globally and regionally as well, uh, is um, a pretty good backbone of, in meteorology for satellites and ground systems. Oceanography has acoustic Doppler and various uh, measurements that they, uh, for buoys, automatic buoys and so forth. Um, there are various chemical measurements. There are various networks, solar radiation networks and so forth globally that work pretty well. So we've come a long way uh, in using technology and our knowledge of science to, to uh, get these kinds of observations out there. One of the messages here, for those of you, particularly the younger ones in the audience, is don't take them for granted. These are fragile observing systems and through one stroke of the pen, uh, Congress can zero them out. So use them. The best way to keep them alive is use them. Use the data from them. Uh, you get even further energized and get into the instruments themselves and try to, try to make impacts because they all need updating regularly. They all need um, infusions of uh, innovation. Uh, and so that, be clear about that. If we just expect them to come over the transom forever, that's not going to happen unless you and uh, let's use them. Um, <clears throat> why are they important? In addition to discovery, exploration, validation of theory, certainly of those things, their, in, their input, what interests me about these, is they are input into the, our vision of tomorrow. They're input along with science for forecasts. And I was brought up in the meteorological community, even as an oceanographer, uh, still not accepted in that community too much, but anyway, uh, they, uh, they, I, I learned that, that forecasts are really important. Uh, and I'm sure you all have dimensions of that in your research here and your work. You may not get around to it yet, but you're learning about the science in order to do this. It will be enabled in the end, somebody, you'll have a model and you'll do some forecasting. The land change in this neighborhood in 20 years will be X, but it will be the observations that will be the proof of the pudding. You must have the OBS. No one's going to believe you without it. And in meteorology, they have that network and you can say, well, the temperature yesterday was supposed to be uh, 30, but it was really 22. You goofed up. You have that measure there, uh, but we need that in all these disciplines, I think. And, uh, but it would be an exciting world indeed to uh, have at your fingertips, even the public who may be interested in different facets, having forecasts of whales, for example, along with forecasts of the weather, along with some climate forecasts for their business, which is an agri-measure, all of that uh, coming to play. So that's the kind of uh, importance that I attach to this. Another one that, that uh, I'll give you one example of that uh, is baseline studies. You, you can't reference the unknown. It's impossible. You can make up surrogates and try to get that done and that's valuable work. And if you're in, working in the paleo, you have to do that. And you take your best guess and you, you develop what you have. In today's world, shame on us if we're not taking the baseline measurements now. And here's an example of where that um, was not done. And to me, it's, it's an embarrassing in a way that we're that far behind. Gulf of Mexico, as most of you know, had a horrible oil spill. Everybody raised their hands. This is terrible tragedy. People died. And then after that, they're worried about what will happen to the coasts. So, in, I was in USGS at the time. <clears throat> Marsha 
McNutt was one of the people put in charge of that uh, business, along with James Lubchenco of NOAA, the administrator there. And they kind of orchestrated two agency efforts to help. Guess what? As some of you already know the answer. We don't have the baseline measurements. They were there in some places, but not enough. So how do we know if the oil made a difference or not? You can't go back, or you can, but uh, in some areas, but most of the others, you had to make it up. You could go through satell old satellite pictures and try to guess at maybe what happened there, but you, it's a pity that they weren't regular measurements of the Gulf of Mexico coastline made. The eco, and I'm talking the ecology me the measurements, the biology, the ecosystems, What's going on there? Um, and I think that's going to be more and more important because we're going to have one, I don't want to predict disaster, but these hazards are going to happen because we're going to take more risk. And risk involves accidents. And accidents uh, uh, could, can hurt the environment. So baseline studies, and they're done through observations, and again, in good science. At this rate, by the way, the talk will be about five hours, so I, <laughs> I'm going to have to move on to a, to a different topic, but I think you get it. Um, and by the way, just to reemphasize, the people that I talk to, some of which are in the audience today, they get it. You know, they, they're doing observations, they're sharing them, they're working with other disciplines. It's important, and uh, that's not too common, by the way, and, uh, and really special, and you're to be commended for that. So let's look at some, uh, well, I have another example, let's forget about that, but uh, just to point out that uh, some uh, areas of science, climate change, big area, science, depend on, uh, if you get back to the nub of it, uh, there's one time series that, that, uh, that uh, is there, it's Keeling's CO2 series, and for those of you who probably know the story, but when Keeling went out to make those measurements, he was making them under an NSF grant, and what's the number? Three years, three years. In three years, he saw, well, he saw the breathing of the planet, which is interesting on its own, but you know, a few cycles might be going up. Didn't know. I want to extend my grant. It was extended once, and then the story goes. And I have this from a fellow that was right in the review itself. They were going to just stop it. Can you imagine what we would have without Keeling's curve? We'd have a bunch of hypotheses, lots of them, but we wouldn't have the the actual evidence that CO2 is increasing and with the greenhouse effect, we're going to be warming. No question about it. Where and when and all of that, that's, that's another science uh, uh, lecture, but the basis is the observation. And what would happen if we didn't have Keeling's measurements? So some of this is not hundreds of millions and gigabytes and so forth, some of this is we don't even use that term anymore. In my uh, travels through the university, the lowest number, the smallest figure I heard was terabyte. And this morning we talked te uh, petabytes. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but just think, just a million, a couple million bits, and, uh, and you have it. Really important. Uh, so, the... Uh, if the measurement, uh, and the other idea is, if Keeling had not made his measurements, we can't go back. Yes, we could probably find surrogates, there's some gas and ice, and we can do a little work there, but we wouldn't know for certain. And when there's trillions of dollars at stake, you better know for certain. You're not guessing anymore. This is, if you're really talking about global economies, you've got to know. So. Every time you think about an observation and it's not made, you're not going to be able to make it up. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm probably offending some modelers, but uh, 
you'll go back and you'll fill it in, use some approximate theorem. Laplace was a very good uh, gentleman for filling things in, and we'll all use it, but it's not real. It's an approximation, and you might be led astray, as most oceanographers were using the whole uh, modeling theory before satellites. And all of a sudden, oh, there's structure there, lots of structure. Uh, that's the same, that's what you find out when you do measurements. So, uh, and one, one final point before we go to the agencies, and that's international. Uh, <clears throat> because, and that's the global side that I'm on, many of you don't need to participate in global exercises, um, but I think more and more people realize their data is actually being influenced by the region, which is being influenced by another region and so on, until you get a global kind of picture. But uh, I'm familiar with the, the basic model here is the World Meteorological Organization, WMO. So they were created in 52 or 50, something like that. They've had 60 years of experience. And what they've done, because they had to have data in order to do some forecasting, draw the maps and do the forecast, they had to have this data taken at standard times, standard levels, standard qualities, and they have had all this exchanged within some fast amount of time, hours, not, not days. And so this organization over these 60 years have done that. So I'm sure in this campus you'll, well, any kind of uh, uh, internet uh, website, you can get, just see it clicking away. You'll, you can get global data. All the countries, 194 countries, share their data. They share it because they know they can get their own meteorological forecast going by doing that. Uh, and it works. It's a good, it's a good uh, model. Another, and I'm only going to do two of these, but there's, there, the next one is this multidisciplinary nature of things. In the 2003, so it's right in this decade, <clears throat> last decade, um, a couple of us in NOAA, myself, uh, Conrad Lautenbacher, who was administrator, said, hey, let's, Earth observations are, are so important. We need to make these measurements now, not in 30 years. Let's get a uh, couple of countries together and see if we couldn't do some work beyond meteorology, get, get into chemistry, biology, very hard, ecology, get into some of these other areas and see if we couldn't get some agreement right now on data sharing, on coordination of observation <coughs> programs. And uh, we invited 20 countries to come, State Department hosted it. Uh, for those of you, some are too young, but those of you remember Colin Powell, he uh, introduced the conference. Turns out he, he gave a wonderful speech, if you ever can get it uh, on, the, on the net. It's just astounding. Here he is thinking about war, you know, and he's talking about the environment in a very delicate, sensitive way. Wonderful speech. We had six, five other ministers from the U.S., five other secretaries that, that were there. So it was really got the attention of of people, uh, and, uh, and the 20 countries thought it was a good idea. The, the short answer of the, of the result was they created this organization called the Group on Earth Observations, GEO, and I'll just jump from there to 2012 and say that now a GEO has a home, it's in Geneva with the WMO, right in the same building, uh, and uh, it has 85 countries on its way to 140. So just to let you know there's things out there that will help you uh, coordinate and there are countries where you can say I'd like X and you cite WMO as the example and they will give you X. Uh, and it's facilitated in part by these organizations. If you get called upon to volunteer, I would encourage you to do so. Second me message of the talk uh, because they don't have any, these organizations don't have money. They need good science to do some good thinking. They don't want to be controlled by bureaucrats. And it's so easy, having a bureaucratic career myself, so easy just to lob answers without foundation. It needs good science uh, not to do that. So take it to heart. 
I understand, was it Kathy, you were telling me that 80% of the students here have to have an international, or the goal is to have an international experience? Uh, that's at the other Montana University. Oh, well, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Well, the other side has this goal of 80%. Maybe you put these organizations even here. They would be great places to go to see how things don't work and do work, to glimpse in. Uh, and and uh, even as a student, you could, uh, particularly grad student, you could make an impact there. Anyway, uh, let's, uh, that's enough for uh, international. Oh, let me just give you the, the, uh, the, uh, one of the goals beyond sharing and beyond coordination, one of the goals of GEO is, is to keep track of, of, of data's impact on what we call social, social benefits. And I'll read these so I don't forget them, but this is right in the declaration of the organization GEO. Uh, it includes these social benefit areas. This is where we're going to work with Earth observations, show you how broadbanded it is. Weather, climate, disasters, ecosystems, biodiversity, energy, health, water, and agriculture. That's a mouthful. So you've got almost everybody's um, play, can play in that arena. Uh, and the idea is, and I just hit it today, by the way, I don't know, I don't see him in the audience, but that, that not only do we coordinate observing systems, but we, we use them for multipurpose. That is, that, it's just surprising that people don't know, the oceanographers don't know that AVHRR, which is a satellite measurement, wasn't intended for oceanography. It's an atmospheric device. It turns out it, it, it revolutionized the thinking about uh, ocean temperatures and substructures and mesoscales and so forth. Uh, today I heard about radar systems which are built for weather. That's what they're supposed to do and the noise, this noise in the weather patterns there in the radar. Turns out they might be birds. Uh, and all of a sudden you have now a, a tool to look at bird migrations. I think fascinating stuff. And you can, there's hundreds and there should be thousands of examples where, multi, where organ, uh, observation systems have been designed for one and used for another. And that should be encouraged. I note that uh, there's some of that going on here. So, all of that aside, next 10 minutes on agencies. And agencies you're familiar with, but I'll just kind of weave them all together. Maybe you have not seen the total picture before. And um, these little vignettes or snapshots are just observations oriented. So for those of you, for example, that work with NSF, it's, it's six billion, I've, I've forgotten the number, but it's a big organization. I'm gonna talk about a little piece of it. And we'll go down the list, and then at the end we'll make some conclusions and see where we are. And I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna use budgets and mission as my organization tool. Just to show you what might be possible out there. And we'll start with NASA. That's the biggest gorilla in this tent. Uh, they have an Earth System Science Program. Some of you are already tapping that. It's $1.8 billion. And it covers such all these disciplines I'm talking about. It, it goes through physics, chemistry, ecosystems, the whole business. And it's set, well, you say, well, that's just for satellite. Uh, companies, the Lockheed, the Northrop Grumman. Well, some of it is. And in fact, some of those actually have spin-offs and give grants and so forth. So you get a little bit that way. But about 20%, and I'm going to add up some numbers for you, is available for research. As long as it's fixed with, this, with their observations, they don't want you working on somebody else's. They'd like you to first find out if the quality is all right. Secondly, if if they'd like you to make a giant leap with their, as they say, if with their observations towards some, a Nobel would be nice, you know. And it, to make NASA missions famous. All these agencies are the same way. They have just more money to do it there. 
Um, the con is, and I heard about it from some of you in talking uh, yesterday, is you have to obey their, you have to support their mission. So even if you don't, and this is true with all the agents I'm talking about, you have to say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this, and I'm, you have to get on their side. Otherwise, they don't, they're not going to appreciate what you are doing. Well, so with a little bit of sacrifice, you can, you can get in these agencies, and many of you are already doing it. So there's NASA. Science Foundation, you are working with, most of you are working with NSF already. I'm not going to do a lot on it, but they have so many. They say they don't do, if you walk in and if you walked into Bement's office a couple of years ago and you say, you're an observation agency, no, I had many talks with him. It turns out they, they're taking a wealth of observations. It's just so associated with their science program. NEON, who some of you are work with, I mean, it may be difficult to work with NEON Inc., but this year, and I looked up their budget, just this year is $85 million, and it's all for infrastructure and these kinds of things. It's a matter of trying to tap into it. Uh, admittedly, that one's difficult, not easy, because uh, they've put up a, this barrier there. But uh, all barriers are up there to be broken down, so it's, it's possible, maybe, that you can get in there. They also have a, this, uh, uh, what do they call it? Um, observatory uh, uh, monitoring facilities. It's a category in their budget. And they've got 103 million, and something that I appreciate, Ocean Observatories Initiative. So they're really getting with it. And if you look at the nature of these, it's not physics anymore. It's the whole range that I've just been talking about. The observatories will me measure everything from biological sampling all through the, uh, the, uh, the whole wealth of, of what we, we uh, think about in, the, in, in terms of the ocean. Uh, NOAA, the, the part that I, when I manage the weather satellites, which by the way, I, uh, it, it, I use that so people understand what I mean, but in, in NOAA I made a, a change in their culture, tried to anyway, call them environmental satellites, because they work not just for weather, but there's a whole range of things now they're used for. Nonetheless, that plus these data centers uh, was about a billion dollars. A lot of money. Again, most of it's going to uh, getting these systems built, but again, about 20% available uh, and NOAA is a little harder to get at, by the way, for those of you who are, have tried. They, they tend to bounce off, ideas bounce off pretty, pretty fast because they have to feed their operational machinery first. But if you have a good idea, I personally can tell you firsthand, and you know the right person, who you know and timing, that's part of my the way I've operated, you can be successful. That's about two billion is the total. Ships, subsurface measurements, fisheries measurements, you get that kind of number. That's a big number. Uh, USGS, I've got to spin through these pretty fast. Right here, they, they have a lot, of, they have tens of programs, uh, little observation programs. I tried to keep track of them when I was there. They're, they're fascinating and some of them are being done right here, right across the street. Uh, they, uh, they have programs on birds, as I just mentioned, invasive species, tracking those. All those fit into this observation arena. Uh, and, uh, and then they have a large satellite program, Landsat. So there's lots, for, for land use change, there's lots of opportunities there. And they have a center, point number three, Eros. Um, how many know about Eros? Two, three? A few. Um, I think it's a great opportunity. It was set up by uh, Senator uh, Pressler of uh, uh, South Dakota, a, a, a nice gentleman, who thought everything should be done in South Dakota. I think you've had a senator like that in Montana. My name is Burns. But uh, anyway, he built Eros. People said, no, we don't need that. And he argued, and I was there, and from a NOAA perspective, it looked a little odd. No, we're going to build this. Uh, okay, we need five million. Well, you can have 30. So we built this center, and they've got twice that now. It's a pretty big enterprise. And they have programs around their data and data applications. It might be a place 
to look in USGS that might not often thought of as a place with a lot of money. It doesn't. By the way, don't get me wrong. There's not a lot of money there. But Eros has some, I don't know if you've looked at it or not, but a collaboration, South Dakota, Montana, looking at the environment, change studies, they've got all the earth resources data that you can imagine, might be worth looking at if you haven't done that. <clears throat> and I know Frank Kelly, who's the new director, guess where he's from? Noah. He's a Met guy. So uh, Frank is, uh, he knows what I'm talking about. And he would be, he's a full and open exchange guy and he believes in getting this, this out. He might be, and he just took over in December. So might be just the guy to, to chat with. DOD, I'm gonna, I, I don't wanna run out of time. I've got 10 minutes here. I'm not gonna go through all their programs, but for those younger people in the audience, don't shy away from them. The, the people that are experienced know that they have large unclassified programs. They're okay. You may think, well, it's all dark. It's not. Uh, they have a lot of unclassified programs and a lot of money. All they need is some ideas. And again, if you f flip it back to their mission, uh, they're interested. They're not interested in just doing research for research's sake. Uh, but, and I've heard one example of, of that in my, my uh, tour yesterday where a, an idea was lobbed up there and yeah, Air Force, great. So just like what we need. And that can be done with Navy, Army, Army Corps of Engineers. Um, I'm most familiar with the Air Force because they do the satellites, but uh, I'm very familiar with the others as well. And there's a lot going on there. Don't ignore it. I put it at 500 million. I could tell you a bigger number, but uh, let's just leave it there. It's, uh, it's a lot. One of the more interesting agencies is the Smithsonian. Uh, they're much smaller. They've got about 50 million in these observation programs, but they're so interesting. They're all mostly eco ecological. There's uh, one I was explaining this morning on the tree girths. They're measuring tree girths in 20 countries. Who does that? Uh, well, Smithsonian does that. And, uh, and they have a big program in Panama uh, that is doing all kinds of tropical work, which maybe could be extended here. I don't know. Uh, Len Hirsch is the fellow I work with over there, and she, just one call, and it, you, you know you, you have all of the, those possibilities. Small amounts of money; they're not big uh, grant, but they they are um, they do their work uh, externally. And not to go over any of the others in particular, but EPA, DOE, USDA. Those are people who belong, as well as the other agencies, in this Earth Observations Network. It's part of a network run by OSTP, the President's Office of Science and Technology Policy. And they are in it because they play in this game. And uh, that's, so those organizations uh, have other programs. Uh, EPA, just to mention their aerosol program, and I think we're take, you're taking advantage of that, uh, I heard. And, uh, uh, but there are others. There are other kinds of efforts that are going on, and not to list them, but finally, there's the National Institutes of Health. And when I sat trying to listen to all these signals, one of the largest signals beyond ecology, or equal to there, is environment and health. It's a big signal and people aren't working on it. There's just millions, there should be billions going into this. And hope, hopefully we'll do it before the, we have an outbreak that's, that's, that's too big. On the one hand, on the other hand, we can control some of these diseases. Just take malaria. Just knowing that it works off of high humidity, precip, and a certain temperature, that's knowing a lot. Once you know that, you can model that, forecast it. Now you know when the onset of malaria is because this mosquito needs that for breeding. And um, so that takes a whole bunch of guesswork out of the doctors that have to treat it. When is the onset? It doesn't cure the disease, however. There's a lot of diseases like that. And Rita Caldwell made one famous, cholera, by, by determining that the ocean temperature off the Indian Ocean was directly related to the onset of cholera on the Indian continent. Amazing uh, discovery, anyway, through observations. So there's a lot going on. 
again, just to repeat, a lot of this is contractor money, but you take 20% of this sum, which is four point, it's actually bigger, but I, I, for purposes here, if you add the numbers I've given you, you get $4.5 billion. If you take about 20% available for, for uh, research and ways to get in there and connect yourself with these observation programs, that's $900 million. Your budget here is $100 million. It's uh, that you take in. Is that about right? So it's a big number. Now you have to compete for that and all of that, but who knew? Research is, by the way, you know, uh, research in this country is 10 times that. Uh, so I'm not talking about overall research, and you have an opportunity for the rest of the spectrum, of course. This is just Earth observation uh, associated research. So what to do? Well, one thing to do is to be aware of it uh, along all those agencies, and you just go to the internet, you could find their budgets and find the right people, and you'll find the programs. And I'm sure most of you, some of you have done that. Um, secondly, there's a piece there that is uh, relevant. It may not pay you any money, but it's good to know, and that's the data management piece associated with all these observation programs. Where are the data? Why, do I have to replicate it here at the university, or can I just get it? Well, there's a whole series of centers that these um, agencies run. CDAC, I could, I could list them all because I, I used to be a director of one of them, and we went out to others. But there's an ocean center, a carbon dioxide center, a greenhouse gas center, a land remote sensing center, et cetera, all of these things. And they're available. So we don't have to repeat that, providing data are shared. If you don't share the data, these central repositories, uh, repositories can't get uh, data, and uh, you won't get a good result. Uh, so share your data. Um, one of the things about these big sums is that um, if you talk about a billion dollar contract each year, I ran an, uh, one which had contracts of about uh, 750 million each year. You can't do contracting to that precision. So, but you can't go over. Because federal spending, it's, it's against the law to, be, to go deficit spending in the government. So, what do you do? You go under. So around, and you find that out when the accountant finally comes up to you, your, your, your assistant there, and says, uh, by the way, we've got 10 million that we couldn't spend this year. Well, that's in June. And, I, and some of you do it already. You should all be thinking in June, well, picking up 10 million, the, the scraps, not so bad. It's an interesting idea. So in June, but I sat there uh, responsible for that money, and some did come in unsolicited grants and contracts. You fund them at the stroke of a pen uh, because they're anxious to get rid of that money. Or, and if they don't, they'll pipe it back in to, to the contract or to something else. Uh, but in a way, those managers want it to, whatever that money is for, to reinforce. So if the observation program contractor couldn't take it, we can get a, a research grant that's working on the observation, it's still reinforcing their, their business model. And so June proposals. And finally, uh, last point is that with these systems, the buzzword in Washington has been for five years maybe, in times of economy, this bad economy it will be even more. It multi-purpose, multidisciplinary, multi-use. So proposals that have, say, three or four of you with heads of uh, biological concerns, climate concerns, uh, physical or chemistry, uh, putting together something as a joint, whether it be between the university or the or the or the uh, U of M, you call it, and MSU, those are looked upon in favor because they, they show efficiencies and they show multipurpose. So it's a really good thing for the, these program managers. It's a good story for them. And you're already doing some of that. I just encourage you, in case you, you think this is a tough road to hoe, it's, I think, 
I've seen it's worth it. Go ahead along those avenues, uh, those multidisciplinary avenues, not only because the money, money might come a little bit easier. I know it's tough to have all those colleagues, you know, working for, their, for that same sum, but the result can be, I think, and should be, much bigger than you could possibly have dreamed of just working by yourself. So, with those uh, thoughts, I'm, at the, uh, I'm near the end, I think. Uh, I've, a few challenges, if these big programs run into problems, they do suck up funds, so you're sitting there trying to work on something, maybe a NASA MODIS program and making some headway with it. Uh, in the case of MODIS, they didn't get into trouble, but if they did, uh, canopy cover was one which you might have been working on, and then they pulled it, you'd be without a research program with no money. So the, there is a danger there, but I, I would say it's, it's the same risk you take with any proposal, really. You, you, you have pitfalls. You just have to, to play the odds, and, and, um, and, it, and dedication makes up for all of this anyway. Um, <clears throat> I've talked about OSTP as a player. Let me make one final point, and then we'll open it up. Um, that's OSTP, the President's Office there of uh, Science and Technology Policy. Um, John Holdren is the head of that. And one way that, this is not for the graduate students, this is for profs and Kathy, is one way to make, uh, to get noticed, is to get Holdren, maybe out with Jane Lomchenko and Marsha McNutt and some others, bring them out to the university. It happens. I know, I sit there at OSTP and, oh, John's at Harvard or John's at uh, Texas A&M. Well, what about MSU? He can come there. He comes because of a, a re you have to get a reason. Maybe there's an event that's, that's there that your, your, your senator's putting on, or maybe your governor wants to have some, a round table discussion on water. Whatever it is, get him associated with that and get a group of people uh, Mike Freilich and NASA, get, get some of those people over here. I think they would, I don't know if they come or not, but if they did, like I did, I think they'd be really excited about what you're doing and would only reinforce uh, all of this to say that, hey, MSU is a player. You are, I understand you're in the top 100 now. It's phenomenal. Uh, somebody should know that. Uh, so, uh, I would encourage you to get those people out. So let me stop. Um, I've missed a few points. Uh, maybe in a question or answer, I can work a few back in. But uh, obviously, I'm energized on, on the topic. And uh, we're making progress. But with your uh, help, uh, I think we continue to generate uh, more progress. So thank you very much for listening. And I'll stop there. Yeah. Ask you a question. Um, you know, I think we all recognize the value of, of Earth observations, and, and you sort of hinted at the vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, programs can be pulled. Mm -hmm. um, the continuity of observations is always threatened. So you know, I'm just curious, where do you see the disconnect? Is it that scientists aren't doing a good enough job? Um, communicating results? Is it, is, it a, is it at a higher administration level that, that uh, um, program managers aren't communicating well enough uh, to, their, to those who they're responsible to? I mean, where, where does that disconnect occur? I'm That's an about. excellent question. He asked, uh, for those of you who might not heard, about continuity of observation. Why are they questioned uh, sometimes and even stopped sometimes? Uh, I told you about the Keeling example, and those were scientists, they, they should be informed and know. So sometimes it's because it's what they don't know. In that occasion, they didn't know the curve was going to continue to go up. NSF was a three-year agency and they had good advice, but uh, what sold the day was one scientist, Roger Revell, if you know the name, stood up and said, look, this is really important. And uh, for those of you who knew Roger, when he his voice carried through their concrete wall, you know. So uh, you, you said, whoa, you, you paid attention. 
Um, and he sponsored Keeling's work at Scripps. So uh, anyway, so that's that one. But why do some of these others not, not work? Why would uh, ozone monitoring call into question when I was, I got this frantic call from Susan Solomon. Some of you may know Susan. She's founder of the ozone hole, if you want to put it that way. Chemist in uh, <clears throat> uh, fluorohydrocarbons. And uh, she called me frantic, They're cut, they cut my budget. I can't do uh, uh, ozone sonds anymore. Well, for those of you who know that business, you need sonds and in the satellite overhead, you need both to make the picture of the hole. Really important. There's a case where billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars were at stake where people stopped making uh, a Freon. And they, we want to see it filling back up. That's the whole idea. Uh, anyway, why did that happen? It, it because these are federal monies, the competition is really stiff, and in this case, some people at OMB, Office of Managing Budget, said, look, this is just, uh, actually they, it was combined with some others, so the total was a million dollars, but in, in the case of the Sons, it's just 100,000 a year. You just absorb this. That's what the at the common mentality. And what they, uh, what they want is either you fight back vehemently or you just lost a million dollars. So it's done on purpose to test uh, in part, that's part of the answer. Um, the other part is that if I knew something about the CO2 measurements, Keeling, I wouldn't go near that. You know, I, I'd be running in the other direction if somebody said, we're gonna cut that uh, program. But in part, uh, these days, the message isn't getting through. So you're on another theme there. I think, and that's why I encourage you, these things are done, uh, the policy, by the way, for Earth Hobbs, as well as science, is set between OSTP and OMB. That's where it is. And you get a budget paper. I don't know if you get those here. It's a three-pager every year, uh, issued in May, something like that. And uh, we used to write, you know, if, if you're close to that, you can write your paragraph. So we did. So you, if you look at the older ones, they all had earth obs in there and built around science, but there are other forms of science that are in there. And if you don't have that, then you get this uh, lack of information. And it's a terrible situation where somebody calls up from OMB and says, you know, the we don't have the science signal here. We don't have anybody's written for, to support um, uh, ships was a good example. So we don't think you need any ships, Noah. Well, we have 13 ships uh, all sinking <laughs> roughly in the 90s. And we needed a couple of billion dollars over 20 years to get some new ships. Well, to an oceanographer, you, you do need satellites. You do need underwater observatories, but for the just to play in the, in the game, you need a ship. Uh, we, don't, we haven't uh, made everything remotely sensed, as you know. So we damn near lost the whole ship program because people, oceanographers in this case, weren't demanding the new equipment and new ships that we had. We got those letters, by the way, and we did save the ship program. So it's a mix, but it's a, it's a question you have to continue to ask. Why is this being cut? And usually it can be fixed. The good news? can be fixed, in my mind. If you just persist and get the right colleagues to, uh, to yell, you can fix it, usually. Yeah? To follow up on Scott's question, I wonder about um, the role of uh, private industries collecting Earth Officers data, like uh, Digital Globe, Earth Watch. Yeah. And I wonder what you see coming down the road with that sort of government programs versus private programs. That is a good question. That's an OMB question, by the way, uh, but because they want that uh, collaboration, and we do too in the government. And in the in situ side, I'll start there, and then I'll go to orbital and some others. In situ side, we have cases where di different agencies, USGS has some, NOAA has some. I'll give you one case in NOAA where we made an agreement with Shell, which is a Dutch company, uh, by the way. Uh, our own American companies wouldn't do it, but, but, but Shell would. And all of the instrumentation in the Gulf of Mexico, all that data is provided in real time to NOAA that is used for 
met, but they also take uh, current OBS uh, for storm surge and all that's available. Wonderful program. So that's an example of how it can work. And the, uh, you're talking about the one to two meter data in the case of satellites. We have, a, we have uh, commercial satellites up there, U.S. owned. <clears throat> we have a bunch that are non-U.S. owned, but let's just talk about the U.S. ones. Uh, each one of those has agreements, some which are terribly expensive and some which are free of charge. Uh, in the case of, uh, uh, we'll just say the Defense Department has bought so much of some of these data that it's not really a business, they, they don't have to make a big business case uh, beyond that to, to be happy. So, um, or Mimage and, and, and some of those are like that. And so you can get the data uh, if it's non-real time in the delayed mode. Some of this is just, you just go on the web and get it, as you know. If you really want the, uh, the, the one meter or the six tenths of a meter stuff, which is as low as it gets publicly to us, uh, then that, that's, that's more painful. Um, but saying you're a researcher helps a lot. As long as you're not competing with them, they will, it's my, my experience that some of these doors open. I, have you had that experience or have you, have you tried? Okay, I, I think you would find they would be open. You say, I'm, you just go on the net, you'll find that you, there's a whole range of these satellites and you'll find, I you see I had nod there, that they'll be able to, to, to probably help you if you're interested in small quantities. You want the whole, you know, everything they've ever taken in Montana, <sighs> you probably can't get that. But, uh, and remember, these are not, they're global satellites, but they're only taking snapshots. They can't take continuous data, like a NOAA satellite covers everything with a 2,000 kilometer uh, pathway, and for every 12 hours, you get coverage. It's not that. It's just, it's very spotty. So you might, if you want certain uh, time in a certain location, they may not have it. I mean, you might have to program it, and that will cost you. So those are the pitfalls, and generally it can be done. Anybody else? Boy, that, you should have asked me that this morning. I would have. <laughs> uh, that's a big deal in my world. I've written a couple of papers on science diplomacy. Uh, not peered, but uh, in fact, I wrote them for, uh, for Marsha uh, in USGS. It's, it's, a, it's a word that has uh, been coined earlier, but now uh, Secretary Clinton and and President Obama both are using this in their speeches. And what it means, for those of you who don't know, it means let's, if we want to go into Iran or, or uh, the Middle East, if we want to go into a territory that might seem to be way out of place politically, let's go in scientifically and maybe we can get some cooperation there and, and play that um, scientific game and at the same time show them that our culture is not so bad and we'll get that kind of diplomacy working and then we'll build up from there. I think it's, it's good. It's happened. It's not new. It's happened for a long time. Now we have a name for it, but uh, and AAAS now has a session on science diplomacy now from, and they will have it from now on. Uh, the one last year was led by USGS. Um, ah, very good. So I, I think it's here to stay. Uh, USGS is really good at this because uh, they have the magic pill, and that's earthquakes. Everybody interested in earthquakes. And uh, they have Middle East conferences. Guess who attends? It, it's kind of quiet, so I wouldn't spread it around. But Israel, Iran, Saudi, Turkey, Afghanistan, they're all in the same room. And believe me, they know they're in the same room. However, it's too important. So they come together, and it's regular. This meeting's been going on for, uh, I think, 20 years. I, I stand corrected, but it's been going a long time. So uh, that's how it works. And they go back. They get what they get is updated on the, 
on what we know about earthquakes, and USGS leads that. Um, but they also then exchange and, well, you can take this data set, and all that happens too. Uh, and it's, one, it's a wonderful example of how we're, we're getting some science done and maybe helping a little bit in our own way. So I'm all, my short answer is I'm all in favor of it. Let's, let's continue. Costs money, though. Thank you.